Hello everyone, before we get into uh, today's topic, I just wanted to give a big thanks to everyone who viewed, commented, and subscribed to the channel based on the Super Saiyan Blue video. Uh, it was something that, uh, it was a project that I really wanted to work on for a long time or something analogous to that, and seeing that it, uh, seeing it blow up like that felt uh, really good. And knowing that there were a lot of people who supported um, what I was doing and the project and things of that nature, it was just really uh, reassuring. And seeing a lot of people subscribe to the channel is something that um, I'm really, really, truly grateful for. Uh, I'm very glad that in one of my first outings I had such positive uh, reception. And I hope that, um, you know, we kind of keep that momentum going, sort of grow a very positive community here. I tried to respond to a lot of the comments that were mentioned, and I think a lot of people had a lot to say about Super Saiyan Blue. And I think I learned quite a bit from uh, the comments of what a lot of people were saying in response. And I think I will be making a follow-up video kind of going over the things I've missed. And I will be crediting uh, a lot of the comments in there and pointing out people who uh, sort of helped me figure that out and helped me uh, go back to make more research. So with that being said, I just wanted to give this uh, little unscripted tangent here at the beginning of the video to show that uh, um, I truly am grateful for everything. Um, and I, I just can't believe that, you know, we're over 30,000 views. Uh, um, and when I posted that, I had less than 40 subscribers. So it's, uh, it's just insane to think about. Uh, so if you're coming here because you subscribed from watching that video, I just want to say thank you so much. And I really appreciate you. And I hope that uh, such a controversial topic like this one doesn't completely uh, turn you away from my channel. Uh, so uh, with that being said, let's get into it. This debate has been quite the funny one throughout the years. Saitama is one of the most notorious characters when it comes to power scaling as, I mean, come on, he's the one punch man. He can defeat anyone in one punch. This notion, which is obviously false, is one crafted by those who are just getting into power scaling or real big Saitama fans who really want to say that he can beat anyone. On the other corner, we have Dragon Ball's Krillin, who is a character in similar circumstances but for the exact opposite reasons. I feel like it's not too uncommon to find someone saying that although Krillin is considered to be one of the weakest Dragon Ball characters, he still solos, insert verse here. I wanted to throw my hat in this ring and give my two cents on who I believe would win this fight and why. Today, we're going to cover the strength of Dragon Ball Super Krillin and the One Punch Man Saitama, and finally determine who's the stronger bald man. To do this, I'll scale both characters individually, going over their strength, durability, techniques, hacks, and abilities. After that's done, we'll see who has the higher displays of power and who will win. I'll compare a fight between the two of them in a couple of conditions, uh, which will be explored once we get there. I want to add that there will be some narrative analysis in this video when it comes to how these characters fight, as I believe addressing these things are just as important when discussing pure power when it comes to power scaling discussions. Before we get into this, I want to add a spoiler warning for the One Punch Man manga, as we're going to cover Saitama's feats from the manga, and that may cause us to go into context as to how slash why these feats are important. Uh, I also want to add that for Krillin, this is specifically going to be talking about the Dragon Ball Super anime. I will mention the manga, but when it comes to his feats against Saitama, we're only using the anime. And all of my sources and references will be cited slash linked in the description below of this video. So Saitama, the caped baldy, the one punch man. I decided to start with Saitama as you guys will come to find that he's much more straightforward with his capabilities. Unlike Krillin, you don't need to scale or compare him to as many other characters as much as most of his feats are of his own displays of strength. Most One Punch Man fans are aware that a lot of Saitama's impressive feats stem from the recent ending to the Monster Association arc, but there are a few things to be said about his strength before this moment. To start with his strength and durability, you'll quickly see that most of his feats are feats through the characters he fights. So this section is going to feature some scaling for a couple of the uh, One Punch Man baddies that Saitama takes on. Saitama's most notorious and widely known feat is his first serious punch against Boros. This attack nullified the collapsing star Roaring Cannon, which is a move whose power has been debated multiple times since the airing of the anime. The range of the collapsing star Roaring Cannon is anywhere from low planetary to star level, which is a very wide gap of power. This wide gap of power stems from different translations of the canon story, and a stray guide that alludes to it being stronger than one might think. Now the manga states that the collapsing star Roaring Cannon is a move that will blow Saitama away and the surface of the planet. In the anime, Boro says he will be releasing all of his energy, 
blasting you, being Saitama, and this planet to hell. I would argue that these two are primary translations, and both of them say that the point of the attack is to wipe out the planet. But it's worth noting that there is a big difference between being planetary and surface planetary. For argument's sake, though, we'll say that the primary sources want it to be a planetary attack. This means that the serious punch would have to be stronger than a planetary attack, and that Saitama is capable of tanking planetary attacks. What's interesting here is that the canon sources clearly say that the attack is supposed to obliterate the Earth. But there's one guide that goes way beyond that. Insert the One Punch Man Notes Secret Compass Volume 1, which is a little guide to the characters uh, when one purchases the Blu-ray set of uh, Season 1 of One Punch Man. Part of these characters is Boros, and when addressing Saitama's serious punch, it states that, to counter Boros's ultimate collapsing star roaring cannon, which is formidable enough to obliterate a star, Saitama resorts to his serious punch. This means that if we're going solely off this guide, Boros would be star level, and Saitama would be beyond it. The only issue here is that this is way stronger than what the series tells us. However, one could argue that Boros has no reason to say that he would obliterate uh, a star, since he wasn't aiming the attack at a star, he was aiming it at the planet. This explanation, though, only accounts for the anime quote, as in the manga we all know uh, that Boros says something very different. One last thing I want to add here is that if we commit to the collapsing star roaring cannon slash the serious punch being star level due to this guide, then there is another fact we have to accept. That being that Saitama was damaged or had to exert effort against Boros. This is more of a durability discussion, but within the same guide, covering Boros's meteoric burst, the OPM notes says that the form, when released, his speed and power goes beyond the physical limits of what any living creature can endure, and that even Saitama is sort of clobbered. Now, this doesn't mean that Boros was ne anywhere near killing Saitama, as it's clear Saitama was letting himself get ragdolled, but it is possible that Boros pierced his durability, even if it was to the slightest degree. Now, this section is separate from what is said about the collapsing star roaring cannon, so I think what the guide is trying to say is that if Saitama were to get hit by the attack, he would take some more damage, due to, you know, uh, meteoric burst Boros most likely being weaker than uh, meteoric burst Boros specifically using the uh, move. So to sum up everything regarding Boros, we have, to, we have to commit to one of two possibilities. Either we go strictly off the primary sources, where Boros is a planetary being who can't damage Saitama, therefore we don't know the upper limits of Saitama's durability or attack potency. Or, Boros is a star-level being who can slightly pierce Saitama's durability, therefore the upper limit of Saitama's durability slash attack potency would be way beyond star-level. The issue with committing to the former is that we can't really say anything about Saitama's power while scaling Boros. In doing so, we'd get no closer to uh, you know, the goal of figuring out how strong Saitama is. But if we take the latter, you'll soon see that it may be consistent with what comes later in the series. So for now, we're going to go with that. Moving on to more modern feats of Saitama's strength, we need to look at his final fight with Gara. From here on out, the Saitama section is going to have spoilers for One Punch Man chapters 159 and onward. Essentially here, we're going to be scaling Saitama off of his own feats as well as the feats of Garo, as the two of them, for a brief period of time, were equals in power. Before Cosmic Fear Mode comes to be, although not exactly a feat, there is something that uh, Saitama hints at to uh, him being planetary, as he mentions to Garo that he's so ticked off about losing his stuff that he could destroy the entire world. After this, nearly all of Saitama's feats stem from his fight against Garo Cosmic Fear Mode. There are a couple of moments to highlight before getting into their extreme feats. Uh, so the first one I want to highlight is when Garo takes on the mode Saitama. Here, Garo mimics Saitama's power and the two of them use consecutive normal punches against each other and they go blow for blow. Although this is the case, what's really important to mention here is that Saitama says, Aw man, I told that kid I wouldn't get a scratch. This means that Saitama is capable of taking damage if someone exists at around his level of strength. After this, there's one more thing to cover before Saitama's rage. This is Garo's Gamma Ray Burst from the Fist of Eradicating All Life Forms. This attack is something that mimics a real-world concept by the same name. Now, the manga points out that this cosmic phenomenon is one of the most powerful type, types of explosions known to humanity. And a quick Google search told me that these explosions are the biggest since the Big Bang, and that they are hundreds of times more powerful than a supernova, and about a million trillion times brighter than the sun. If this is the case, the Cosmic Fear Mode Garo would easily be a character in the Solar System Plus range and would even tip into the galaxy level. But I think there are a couple of showings in the story that show that this isn't necessarily the case, 
as Garo's Blast isn't as strong as a traditional Gamma Burst Ray. First off, there's a panel which displays an outside view of a star being blown up in this manner, and the explosion is way bigger than what Garo's attack is shown to be. Garo's attack is one displayed above the ocean, compared to a literal star blowing up. Now this means that the attack was performed on Earth, and it didn't destroy the planet, and it's shown that normal humans are capable of existing nearby, and they are capable of resisting its gravitational pull. Because of these reasons, I think it's safe to say that this attack is in the planetary or star range of power, but I don't think there's enough shown to indicate that it could be anything above solar system level quite yet. Finally, before the attack is launched, Saitama says, whatever you're doing could be disastrous, even if it grazes the Earth's surface. Now, I think this line in particular would set it pretty close to star range, and you could scale this to the collapsing Star Warring Cannon, as the two moves are similar in purpose and reaction from Saitama. This is important to cover as Saitama blatantly tanks the move, showing that even before his exponential growth, he was capable of taking attacks on this level. It's important to mention here that once their fight starts ramping up, Saitama doesn't really pull his punches. From here on out, we have to remember that Saitama is fighting Garo seriously, even if he's doing it with one hand. First off, after the serious punch squared, we see that Blast transfers the energy out into space. Garo and Saitama managed to obliterate a multitude of stars from the clashing of their fists. This would at least put the two of them within solar system levels of power, but I think if one really wanted to say that this makes them galaxy level, then I wouldn't wholeheartedly disagree. However, this would be a highball for the two of them, as there is a vast difference between solar system and galaxy levels of power. But since we only have an observation to go off of, nothing is really set in stone. This also doubles as a durability feat, as the explosion from their blast did manage to blow back both Saitama and Garo, but the two seem pretty unfazed damage-wise by this. As their fight evolves, we see that Saitama is capable of table-flipping the surface of one of Jupiter's moons. Now, this feat isn't that impressive when compared to the star-slash-solar system range we have these two set at, but I thought I would mention it as it is a direct display of Saitama's power, as well as how precise he's allowed to be with his power. We also know that Saitama is durable enough to take what he can dish, as Garo continued to evolve himself and attack Saitama after the series punch squared. Overall, pre-exponential growth, I think it's safe to say that Saitama is a being within the solar system plus range of both attack potency and durability. It is possible that he could be teetering on galaxy levels of power, but I don't think there is enough shown to indicate that he's at that level of strength. Finally, to wrap up Saitama's strength slash durability, we gotta address his exponential growth. Saitama, by the end of the Garo fight, reaches a point of strength that Garo can no longer catch up to. This is something that is incredibly impressive, as Garo goes from a being who's street level to mountain level pre-cosmic fear mode in only a matter of weeks. This means that Saitama is not only surpassing him, but making it impossible for Garo to catch back up puts him at such an unknown level that even the manga addresses that no one knows where Saitama's at. We see him sneeze away the entirety of Jupiter and literally fart back from Jupiter to Earth in a damn near instant. What I think is really funny about this version of Saitama is that it puts Saitama right back in the state he was pre-Garo fight. He has his feats, but since we know that those feats are nowhere near his full power, we have no idea what the upper limits of his power are. We just know that he's way beyond his former solar system level self. I definitely think you could argue that this version of Saitama might be universal, as there's such a gap between him and Garo, but I think we can confidently say that he is in the mid to high galaxy range of attack potency and durability. As you guys will see though, because this version of Saitama is so unknown, I'll be discussing both this version and the pre-exponential growth Saitama when comparing him to Krillin's power later. As for abilities slash techniques, Saitama has some simple moves that are the result of his overwhelming strength. To list them out, there's the normal consecutive punches, which is a flurry of normal punches by Saitama. Very few have survived such an attack, and I believe the only two would be uh, Garo and Boros. And then there's uh, the after image creation, uh, which is the illusion of after images and making clones of himself. This is usually as the result of other moves discussed in the Sirius series. And so now we're going to get into the Sirius series. Now these moves are... You know, when Saitama takes the fight seriously, obviously, I'm sure you guys picked up on that. Or it's usually part of his, like, killing moves. Um, so yeah. So first off, we have the serious side hops. In this technique, Saitama jumps side to side very quickly. This is one of the instances of his after-image creation. Next up, we have the serious squirt gun. 
This technique involves Saitama literally squirting magma from his hands, and it comes out with such immense force that it combats a blast from Monster King Orochi, one of the strongest monsters in the One Punch Man series. Next up, we have the series Table Flip. And the Table Flip is where Saitama flips the surface of one of Jupiter's moons. He does this by digging his hand to the ground and simply lifting it up. Its effect is to mostly disorient Garo. Next up, we have the series Sneeze, which is one of the funniest moves on this list, as Saitama literally does it to get rid of the entirety of Jupiter. It seems that uh, it's just a really, really powerful sneeze, and there probably isn't much strategy used in this technique. Following that, we have the Serious Punch. And the Serious Punch is Saitama's most known technique. It's a pretty simple move, and it's the first introduced within the Serious series. And it's just a really, really, really strong punch. Enough said. And to wrap up the Sirius series, we have the Omnidirectional Sirius Punch. The Omnidirectional Sirius Punch is one of Saitama's coolest moves, in my opinion. Used in tandem with the Sirius Table Flip, Saitama heavily disorients Garo and hits him with a flurry of Sirius Punches. This is uh, the other instance and the other technique that uses the after images. At least that's what Garo says. It's clear that Saitama is hitting Garo a bunch of times, as Garo then says that Saitama is using his strength to jump around the fragments of the moon to constantly attack him. And now to wrap up the Saitama section, let's go through his resistances, immunities, and his hacks. These are essentially things shown to not affect Saitama as he's just that powerful. It's worth noting here that it does seem that if some of these abilities were potent enough that they might be able to penetrate his defenses, but such power has never been shown within One Punch Man. The first of these immunities is Saitama being immune to the vacuum of space. There are two instances of this being relevant in the series, uh, being Saitama's fight against Boros, where Boros knocks him to the moon, and his fight against Garo, where the two of them fight on Jupiter. It's unclear whether or not he can breathe in space, as against Boros he can't, but against Garo he can, or at the very least he can talk when he's uh, fighting Garo, but it is clear that he has no trouble surviving either. Uh, next up we have heat slash pressure resistance. While fighting the Monster King Orochi, Saitama is literally chilling at the center of the earth and manages to adjust to the magma in there as if it were a hot tub. Obviously this is super duper hot, but the pressure of the center of the earth is uh, immensely higher than the pressure of the earth's surface. Uh, next up we have radiation resistance. This one is mainly shown in his fight with Garo, but it becomes clear to the reader that Saitama is built differently when it comes to taking on radiation. He can resist it easily and he's one of three humans who can the others being uh, Genos and Blast. Finally, and most recently shown, is Saitama's resistance to psychic abilities. When fighting Tatsumaki, uh, the strongest psychic in the series, seem to be stronger than psychics on a continental scale, Saitama is just sort of unfazed by her abilities. It's worth noting here that Saitama is slightly affected as he says his muscles are spazzing out, but it's clear that this is doing nothing to him damage-wise. Uh, there's also this display against Boros' henchman uh, Geryugenshoop, I know I'm not pronouncing that right, but you know, just it, it, it's a weird alien name. But the manga doesn't show much here. The anime, on the other hand, uh, Goryugenshub compares his powers to that of a black hole. But I think it's pretty clear here that he's just making an analogy to explain how his powers work. Because if he were actually as strong as a black hole, he would quite literally neg Boros, which doesn't make too much sense. As for some of the bigger hacks, there's negation of spatial manipulation. When a character by the name of Phoenix Man creates a pocket dimension within his body, Saitama sort of just enters the space unprompted. This is to the surprise of Child Emperor who's trapped in there and Phoenix Man. And when asked how he did it, Saitama simply says that he knocked. Uh, and now this is one of my favorite of Saitama's resistances due to this moment here. So essentially what happens is that when fighting Garo, Garo is capable of making space gates, which are essentially portals that he can like, you know, surprise the enemies from. And we see that Saitama is capable of grabbing, kicking, and straight up negating the effects of these portals. And it's just so cool to see Saitama finally, like, fight seriously, and just see him, like, negate, like, just such a powerful ability. It's, it's, it's so cool. Uh, but next up, we have Technique Copying or Instant Mimicry. For this ability, uh, one shows that Saitama is capable of mimicking and copying any ability he sees similar to Garo. It's worth noting here that Garo uh, says that this is instant mimicry, and it's a specialty. This is applied mainly to this uh, next hack, which is time travel. Now, Saitama was able to manipulate his own atoms slash particles to allow himself to travel backward through time. 
This ability may seem pretty niche, but I think it displays the upper ends of Saitama's reality warping slash resistance is to said warping. So now we've covered uh, Saitama and we have not complete. As uh, I'm sure you guys could have guessed, Saitama is a pretty strong guy. But with that being said, let's get into the Krill dog. Krillin is an interesting Dragon Ball character to scale. Like most Dragon Ball characters, we have to primarily scale him to Goku, which is what I'll do here. Although much of these feats aren't going to be too relevant until we reach Super, I think it'll be worth quickly going over Krillin's display of power throughout the series. I'm going to start this with the OG series, then go to Z, and wrap up with the Super anime where Krillin is at his strongest. To start off with the OG series, something we know about Krillin in early, early Dragon Ball is that he's somewhat comparable to a kid Goku but both of which, by the time of the 21st World Tournament, lose to Master Roshi. The strength of suppressed Roshi is unclear, but we do know that full power Roshi is capable of busting the moon, so we can safely conclude that Krillin is, uh, at this point, below that level. Krillin then trains quite a bit until the 23rd World Tournament, where he fights Piccolo Jr. and loses. After this fight, both Roshi and Goku applaud Krillin's performance, with Goku saying that he's incredible and Roshi saying that he's become a splendid martial artist. Moving into Dragon Ball Z, Krillin trains to defeat the Saiyans with the other humans and manages to destroy four Cybermen at once. This is important to note as the Cybermen are as strong as Raditz who had a power level of 1200. Raditz required both Piccolo and Goku post Dragon Ball to defeat. This means that Krillin at full power in the Saiyan Saga is way stronger than both Goku and Piccolo post OG Dragon Ball. Piccolo Jr. during his introduction in the original series is stronger than his father who is capable of destroying the surface of the planet. So right off the bat we have Saiyan Saga Krillin combating the lower ends of the planetary tier with the power level safely over 1200. We'll be revisiting the Saiyan Saga later when we reach Krillin's techniques, but before we reach the Namek Saga there's something I want to explain. Since we're in the realm of power levels, I think it's important here to reference some guides that give uh, power levels to these characters. To avoid estimates and whatnot, I'm going to be referring to Kaizenshu's translations of a couple of guides, those being Daizenshu 7 and the 1990 scan of the V-Jump issue. These guides give further elaboration onto the canon series and help explain some of the power, uh, power levels here. I do want to add, though, that once power levels are abandoned, some of these guides continue to give power levels and uh, they may be irrelevant and sometimes illogical. They might be inconsistent. Although setting consistencies will not matter for this video, as you guys are about to see that these power levels are pretty consistent with the canon manga, I want to explain this for complete transparency when it comes to where I'm getting my information. An example of these guides being consistent would be the reading of Krillin's power in the Saiyan Saga. Dazen entry 7 that full power Krillin's power level is 1770, uh, which is substantially greater than Raditz's canon power level of 1200, which explains why Krillin was able to eradicate four Cybermen at once. This 1770 aligns with a later power level of Krillin being 1500, which he exerts soon after the Saiyan Saga. And with all that being said, I'm going to explain the range of power Krillin could be in for the Namek Saga, then explain what the guides say about his power. Now, the Namek Saga is one of the last sagas where Krillin has some major importance in Dragon Ball Z, but there are some things in the Buu Saga that I will be going over. Namek shows Krillin getting his potential unleashed by the Grand Elder Guru in Chapter 71 of DBZ. Krillin explains that he's never felt such power before. Our first indication of how strong Krillin became comes from Vegeta when he notices Krillin's power and says that it's a great power, but it's inferior to Zarbon's. It's unclear if Vegeta is referring to Zarbon before or after his transformation. However, I think if we do some little digging, it becomes clear that Vegeta is referring to Zarbon pre-transformation, as later in the arc when fighting Galdo, we learn that both Krillin and Gohan have a power level of over 10,000. This would make Krillin stronger than Goku in the Saiyan Saga without the Kaioken. This is supported further by Daizenshu 7, which says that Krillin at this time has a power level of 1300, which is over the 10,000 as described by Raccoon. What's really important to understand about Krillin reaching this power level is that there is an important character we can scale him to at this level of power, that character being King Vegeta. What we know about King Vegeta's power is that Vegeta surpassed him when he was a kid, meaning that his power level was under the 18,000. Vegeta was at when he reached Earth. This is important as King Vegeta has quite a feat in a filler flashback of the DBZ anime. In this flashback, King Vegeta wipes out multiple planets with a wave of his hand. Now, King Vegeta's exact power level is a difficult one to pinpoint using purely canon material, but I think it's safe to say that he's floating around the 10,000 range, as it would make sense for him to be stronger than the likes of Nappa, and there are a couple of non-canon sources that allude to this conclusion. The first is Broly the Legendary Super Saiyan, 
where King Vegeta was fearful of Broly's power level, but was still able to wound him. The second is the Funimation dub of Bardock, the father of Goku. As Bardock's power level in this English dub is approaching 10,000, and that he might be surpassing King Vegeta soon. All of this is important because if we were to accept all of these feats, Krillin during his Goldo fight would be matching the power level of King Vegeta, meaning that Krillin can casually wipe out multiple planets. There's one more thing here we need to address before we leave Namek, and that's a power level from the 1990 issue of V-Jump. This V-Jump issue reveals that Krillin's power level is 75,000 after fighting Goldo. This may seem insane, but there is just enough here to explain why this is justifiable and consistent with the manga. When looking at Chapter 101, just before the fight with Frieza, Vegeta says that these Earthlings' battle strengths keep rising. The young one has power in him he can't even dream of. It's clear that in this statement, Vegeta is referring to Krillin as well, showing that he has gotten stronger, but Gohan is still ahead of it. Referring back to the V-Jump scan, we see that Gohan's power level is a whopping 200,000, maintaining consistency with the manga. Feet-wise, Krillin is immensely powerful at this point, as he's definitely multi-planetary, but I don't think there's quite enough to say that he's at star level yet. Unfortunately, there isn't too much to say about Krillin in the Cell Saga. We know he trains for the coming of the androids, but in terms of how much stronger he got, we're not quite sure. Because of this, I'm just going to skip right to the Boo Saga, as there are a couple of displays here that show how strong Krillin is. The first indication of Krillin's power in the Boo Saga comes early on, when Gohan is recruiting the Z Fighters for the 25th World Martial Arts Tournament. Here, Gohan goes to Krillin to let him know what's going on, and Krillin says that he won't be able to compete with the likes of Goku and Vegeta, and with Piccolo in the mix, it would be difficult for him to make it to the top 5. Now these three characters in the Cell Saga are clearly starbusters in terms of their power, with Piccolo being beyond the likes of Android 17 and 18, Vegeta being more powerful than Semi-Perfect Cell, who's way beyond those androids, and Goku being the pinnacle of the three of them at just under Perfect Cell, who was not too far away from solar system busting. In terms of uh, who Krillin is scaling to here, it's interesting to think about as Krillin knows that both Vegeta and Piccolo would still be training and thus are stronger than their Cell Saga selves. Vegeta in particular can easily be inferred to be stronger than SS2 Gohan and Perfect Cell, who are confirmed solar system busters. Piccolo's growth is another one that's a bit undefined, but one can easily infer that he is weaker than the Supreme Kai, who in turn is weaker than Deborah, or at the very least, the Supreme Kai fears Deborah's power, and then Deborah is said to have been about as strong as Cell. But since this is said by Goku, it's unclear if he's referring to Perfect Cell or Super Perfect Cell. My guess is that he'd be talking about Super Perfect Cell since Gohan does struggle a bit to beat Deborah. All this is to say that since Krillin is weaker than Piccolo, but he could potentially high diff him, and Piccolo is weaker than Shin, who's weaker than Deborah, who's as strong as Super Perfect Cell, we know that Krillin is not yet at the solar system levels of power. The thing here, though, is that if we're saying that this Krillin is comparable to Piccolo, then he's definitely in the star levels of power as Piccolo was capable of beating Android 17, or at the very least was even with Android 17, who can absolutely neg early Cell Saga Saiyans, Super Saiyans. I also wanted to go in depth on some anime filler here that would indicate that Krillin is as strong or at least comparable to Cell, but I don't think I wanted to count it towards the video as I think the manga is pretty clear in showing that Krillin is weaker than Cell, who is a solar system uh, buster. But with all that being said, let's get into Dragon Ball Super. And I just said that, but before I get real into this, I want to say that the point of me going in depth into Krillin from the original series, even though he doesn't compete with the upper tier of Saitama's power, is that it shows that Krillin is somewhat keeping up with the Z fighters and isn't just a pebble compared to their past selves. For example, we just broke down why Krillin in the Buu Saga is capable or at least comparable to taking on early Cell Saga Goku, even though he's consistently weaker than Goku in the present. This logic is incredibly relevant when we reach Super, as if it were applied to Super Krillin, which we're going to find out that it does apply to Super Krillin, then we can see that Krillin does become an insanely strong character. So there's really one arc of Super that gives Krillin really anything to talk about, and that's the Tournament of Power. But before we get into that, we see him get one shot by base god Goku post uh, god power absorption. This feat may seem pretty pathetic, but we know that Saiyan Beyond God Base Goku is a character within the universe realms of power, so I think there's something to say here about Krillin's durability. This punch is also a test to see how strong Base Goku is, as Krillin specifically wants him to do it to test Goku's power. This, however, is Krillin's only relevant feat in early Super, so from here on out we'll be discussing the Tournament of Power. 
Now, the T.O.P. gives Krillin one of the most notorious fights in all of Dragon Ball Super, that being his sparring match with Goku in Episode 84. This comes after Episodes 75 and 76, which establish that Krillin is going back to his training. In this episode, Krillin fights Goku in an area that's trying to simulate a tournament setting. In this setting, Krillin uses a Ki Blast to try to knock Goku out of the ring, and Goku is actually forced to use Super Saiyan. This is really, really important when it comes to Krillin scaling. As if we were to scale him to Super Goku literally at all, then Krillin is far beyond everything in Dragon Ball Z. For a recap for the few who don't know, early Dragon Ball Super has Goku fighting Beerus in the Super Saiyan God form. During their fight, the two threaten to annihilate everything in Universe 7 while trying to suppress their power. This means that God Goku is easily within the universe realms of power slash durability. Goku then absorbs all that power into his base form and becomes known as the Saiyan Beyond God Goku. This means that post-Battle of God's base Goku is equal in power to Battle of God's God Goku, which in turn means that post-Battle of God's base Goku at full power is a universal being. Then we add three arcs worth of training, then there's really no telling how strong base Goku is pre-tournament of power. Okay, like, there, there is a way to figure that out, but this is about Krillin, so it's not relevant towards this video. So, when we reach this all the way back to Krillin, him pushing Goku to go Super Saiyan is an incredible feat of strength. I think the thing many people don't want to think about when addressing Krillin's fight with Goku is that if this were true, then we'll see that this makes Krillin scaling in Super pretty consistent with how he was scaled in Z. Obviously, he's nowhere near the upper limits of Goku's power, but plop him against Goku pre-Battle of Gods, and Krillin may just give him a run for his money. I want to make it clear that I'm not saying Krillin is stronger than Tournament of Power Super Saiyan Goku. Hell, if you think he's weaker than Tournament of Power base Goku, then I can understand that. But the point I'm trying to get across here is that if Krillin is even comparable, close to comparable against base Goku at this time, then he is quite literally a galactic level being. It would be a gross lowball to say that he's galaxy level in terms of attack potency and durability. And if you think he's anything under that, then I think you're just straight up going against what the narrative is clearly displaying here. Before we get into Krillin's techniques, I want to address what the super manga has to say about Krillin. Now I explained at the start of the video that this is not an analysis of Krillin's power within the manga, as we're specifically using his anime counterpart. I wanted to talk about the manga here to show some of its consistencies of how Krillin's power is utilized within the grander narrative of Super slash Dragon Ball. So to repeat, when we get into the versus battle, feats from the manga will not be used against Saitama. This section only serves as a discussion for how Krillin's power is treated within Super's manga and how that then relates back to the rest of the canon series. Within the T.O.P. there isn't much shown uh, in terms of his power. In fact, Krillin gets literally zero fights. He doesn't have his sparring match with Goku or Gohan and Frost instantly knocks him off within the tournament of tournament's second chapter. The Moro Saga, however, has Krillin fighting some of Moro's goons. This is important to note as these goons are artificially juiced up in power by Moro to make them competent fighters. When a wave of them hits Goku and Vegeta, the two of them are forced to go Super Saiyan Blue. Krillin fights one of Sa- I, I, I always mess up this dude's name. Saganbo's galactic bandits uh, named Yunbo, and ends up winning. This isn't to say that Krillin is anywhere near as powerful as Blue Goku and Vegeta, just another display of how Krillin can hold his own with lesser yet stronger characters throughout the series. With all of that done, let's get into Krillin's abilities and techniques. As with most Dragon Ball characters, Krillin has the ability to fly and shoot Ki Blasts. He can also sense the power of other fighters. Although Krillin can fly, he also uses his ability to fire Ki Blasts to dodge attacks or propel himself a certain distance. So the first technique we have to cover is the uh, you know most uh, obvious one, uh, the Kamehameha Wave. Krillin is one of the first users of the Kamehameha after learning it from Master Roshi. He has his own variant of the move known as the Scatter Kamehameha, which is a move that can split and hit multiple enemies. Next up we have the Kanyanzan or the Destructo Disc. Now the Destructo Disc is Krillin's signature technique. It is a concentrated key blast that acts as a blade that can cut through opponents significantly stronger than Krillin. This power difference is most notable when Krillin uses the move on second form Frieza, someone who at this point is at least 13 times more powerful than he was, if we were to divide their power levels. Krillin has a couple of variations of the Destructo Disc that he uses throughout the series. The two most notable ones are the Triple Blade Destructo Disc, where he throws one blade and three uh, blades come out, 
and the Hexka Blade Destructo Disc, where six blades come out. The prowess of the Kianzan is one that's noted by many characters, with it catching Goku off guard, and Goku even using the move to almost knock out Jiren in the T.O.P. That being said, we know because of said moment that the Destructo Disc does have a limit to what it can cut. It just has a ceiling that's higher than most moves in the series, as it can cut beings who are way more powerful than the user. Next up we have the move borrowed from Ten Shinhan, being the Solar Flare. The Solar Flare is a move that shines a bright light and blinds the opponent. The Solar Flare times 100 is a similar move, but Krillin manages to overwhelm the senses of his opponent to the point that they can no longer sense his movement at all. It's important to note that if the, his opponent cannot see to begin with, then the move has no effect. And before we wrap up his abilities, I want to mention a couple of things that impact how Krillin fights. The first of which is how Krillin's confidence plays into his fights. Throughout the series, but mainly the examples I'm going to use are OG Dragon Ball and Super, Krillin is seen to be impacted by his knowledge of his own capabilities. If he's affected by some external influence that makes him think he can't win, then his performance suffers. This can be seen in Resurrection F, uh, when Krillin literally struggles against Frieza soldiers who he was stronger than, like, 15 years ago. Uh, I know that time frame isn't quite right, but, you know, you guys get the point. This can also be seen in the funny gag scene where Goku reminds Krillin he doesn't have a nose in the original series. Up until this point, Krillin thought he couldn't win, but with a reminder of what he's capable of, he can easily beat Bacterian. Recently, this hasn't been much of an issue for Krillin, as with both of the, uh, his mini-arcs pre turn of Power, we see him regain this uh, confidence as a powerful martial artist. I also wanted to talk about Krillin's battle wit and prowess as a martial artist. Being someone who trained alongside Goku, it's no secret that Krillin is incredibly skilled. What I think a lot of people fail to credit is just how skilled Krillin is. In late Super, we see that Krillin is capable of besting fighters like Gohan, who's known to be one of the smartest fighters in the series. He also caught Goku off guard a couple of times, and as previously mentioned, Goku recognizes this from Krillin, even though there's such a power disparity between the two of them. Moving on to resistances slash hacks, Krillin has a lot less defined hacks than Saitama, but there are a few good ones we can infer from the structure of Dragon Ball as a whole. Dragon Ball is a series where characters can usually resist powerful abilities if the character is stronger than the one using said abilities. This can be seen with Majin Vegeta um, in relation to Babidi, or Vegito in relation to Super Buu. If this applies to Krillin, then here are many hacks that Krillin would be resistant to if you were stronger than his opponent. Uh, the ones I have listed are Mind Control, Telekinesis, and Matter Manipulation. And I'm sure there are many more, however Dragon Ball usually doesn't get into that very often. So with all that out of the way, I want to ask you guys, did you learn something new about Krillin? Do you have some new respect for the character, or do you guys think I'm crazy for trying to scale him this high? Uh, none of that really matters though, uh, in terms of my knowledge now, as I'm just going to keep rolling with the video, and you guys will most certainly let me know in the comments. So we finally reached the speculative slash discussive part of the video, being who would win, Saitama or Krillin. To cover just about all bases here, I'm going to be talking about how the two stack up to each other in terms of abilities. Then I'll discuss Krillin versus Saitama both pre and post Saitama's exponential growth. Then I'm going to discuss how I think a fight between the two of them would play out, and we're going to end the video on implications of this discussion, as well as difficulties surrounding reaching a concrete conclusion. When talking about their abilities, I'm sure most of you figured out that there's some pretty big differences between the two of them. Primarily, in the benefit of Saitama, we know that he has much more uh, resistances and immunities to find. He also has more resistances, such as the vacuum of space or temperature differences, when compared to Krillin. Saitama also has some more defined spatial resistances and hacks with his abilities to travel through time. Conversely, we know one thing that Krillin really has on Saitama, uh, and that is ranged attacks. Krillin is capable of firing key blasts and flying, both of which are things Saitama cannot do. I think this could be important if the two of them were to fight, but we know that Saitama, with his overwhelming strength, can get through this pretty easily, if there's ground to stand on. Krillin also has a defined move that can attack opponents much stronger than him, as compared to Saitama, where it seems that he'll need to grow past his opponents to affect them. The two characters are somewhat similar in their prowess with hand-to-hand -hand combat and martial arts. I think neither of them would really outdo each other in this regard, however, if I had to say one, it would definitely be Krillin. But it's clear that Saitama could just copy Krillin's style. And with that, let's get into who's stronger. When discussing Saitama pre-exponential growth, I think it's pretty safe to say that Krillin damn near negs Saitama. 
His display against Goku shows that Krillin is safely within the galaxy ranges of power, and for Saitama, you sort of have to go off of an observation and be quite charitable towards him to say that he's within that realm of power. I can see the two of them going blow for blow with Saitama's series punches, but I think if Saitama were to use his consecutive normal punches, Krillin would pretty easily handle that. When getting into Saitama post-exponential growth, we're in a weird spot, as Saitama in this realm is feetless. I think we could say that if we're highballing Saitama pre-exponential growth to a multi-solar system level or low galaxy, then he gets exponential stronger from there, then Saitama is most likely easily in high galaxy range. If he's combating Krillin at all, then it would be possible for Saitama to easily surpass him in due time if Krillin doesn't finish the fight quick enough. Finally, let's get into what I think would happen. Let's assume that this is Saitama post-growth and that the two of them are comparable in strength for the sake of discussion. If this were the case, and the two of them were to have some sort of casual sparring match that ramps up from there, I think Krillin can manage to maintain his confidence to face Saitama's overwhelming power. I can see the two of them going blow for blow and serious punches for a short amount of time, and they would try to outmaneuver one another via after images. I think Saitama would get tripped up once Krillin starts using his key blasts in flight. Krillin may even get the upper hand when utilizing the Solar Flare times 100, but I think if Krillin is not enraged enough to be in a killing mood, which I guess in the situation I constructed he wouldn't be, then Saitama would easily surpass Krillin in power with enough time passing. With Krillin being as smart as he is, I can see him using the Kanzan to try and damage Saitama, but if Saitama grows fast enough, then this would be ineffective. I think Saitama would end the fight by pulling what he did to Genos and sort of just stop his fist before connecting right before finishing the fight. To wrap it up, I think the two of them would go into it at equal strength, but with Saitama's growth, he would inevitably surpass Krillin in power and beat him. And now before we wrap up the video as a whole, I want to go over some little caveats and bring some more nuance to this discussion that I don't think a lot of people bring uh, when it comes to discussing power scaling. To start with One Punch Man, it's pretty difficult to scale current Saitama as we do not know, nor can not know, just how strong Saitama is. All we can do is see what's going to happen when the One Punch Man manga continues. Much of this discussion is about Saitama's hypothetical strength after Garo, but no one knows what that is for sure. Moving on to Dragon Ball, what's difficult about Krillin's current scaling is that since we have to scale him off of so many different characters, it can be kind of unclear slash muddy figuring out his exact strength. Despite this, I tried my best to figure this out, and I hope you guys appreciated the effort that you know I exerted to go through this. I think Krillin would benefit from someone literally stating how strong he is compared to a certain characters, or just straight up saying, yeah, you know, Krillin can destroy solar systems. Finally, I think it's really important to talk about how these two series differ scaling-wise. Dragon Ball is a series that has always been scaled pretty high, but what's difficult about it is that it's pretty easy to tell that much of these galactic feats of strength aren't taken into consideration when planning out fights. For example, I'm sure the toy writer who had Goku go Super Saiyan against Krillin wasn't thinking about how this makes Krillin a universal being. This is difficult to scale to OPM, where we can see that there is a clear effort made by one in Murata to properly display these galactic levels of power. One Punch Man characters usually have their feats more defined, but even then, you can tell that the OPM scaling falls victim to some weird lowballs and naming fallacies that people like to run with in, in the power scaling community. Overall, before ending the versus section, I want to say that I went into this wanting to make the two of them as equal as possible without denying the pertinent information when it comes to their scaling. I think people can reasonably reach the conclusions I've made about these characters when using the respective mangas as the primary source. And that's it! That's Saitama vs. Krillin. What did you guys think? Do you think Saitama wins, or do you think Krillin has it? Do you guys like this style of power scaling videos, or should I stick to more lore explanations like the Super Saiyan Blue video? Let me know in the comments below. I plan on making similar videos like this and that previous one to other uh, aspects of both series, as I am an avid fan of both Dragon Ball and One Punch Man. So with that, that's just about everything. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day, and I do ask, let's please keep it civil in the comments. I know a lot of people are very, very, very passionate when it comes to scaling both of these series. If you seriously disagree with me, I'm always down for discussion. Just comment, and I'll try to get back to your comment. But um, let, let's at the very least please be respectful towards, uh, you know, your fellow viewers. I'm looking forward to see what everyone has to say, as well as some new info that I might have missed. And once again, thank you for tuning in.